There are moments in your life when God intends to bring a blessing through you to someone else, but has to come uniquely through you because there are some things only you can do. There are some needs only you can see, some hands only you can hold, some prayers only you can pray, some tears only you can cry, some gifts only you can give, some meals only you can cook. There are some people only you can reach, some moments only you can take. Think about it. God placed you in your specific family, in this generation, in this time in history, in your unique demographic situation, in this specific geographic location, so that you can make a difference there. What's your difficult step of obedience that's right in front of you? A great God made you to be great, so act like it. Don't miss your moment. Thousands of years ago in a distant land where kings ruled with total authority and no one dared enter his presence without an invitation, lived a beautiful young woman named Hadassah. She was an orphan and an exile, raised by her cousin who became her guardian. To protect his young cousin, he instructed her to hide her true identity and never used her real name. And it came to pass that the king, who liked to show off his wealth and power with great bouts of drinking and merrymaking, hosted a banquet for all the officials within his vast kingdom. And they traveled to the palace from the outermost reaches and partied for many months. At the height of the feast, the king demanded his wife, the queen, display her beauty before the drunken men. When she refused, she was dismissed her royal crown removed, and the king was alone. A few months passed, and the king grew lonely, so his courtiers suggested a beauty pageant be organized to choose a new queen. The king agreed, and many young women were brought to the palace to compete, including Hadassah. <laughs> now, Hadassah was lovely in face and a figure, but also of heart and she found favor at the palace. Those in charge gave her a special place to live and months of special beauty treatments in preparation for her time with the king. During all this time, she never used her real name, obedient to the instruction of her guardian. You see, her guardian feared that even though their people, the Jews, had been living as exiles in that land for generations, their ancient enemies remained all around them some in positions of great power. And he feared they would stop at nothing to harm and even eliminate them. Sadly, in a short time, his fear would become reality. So as a defenseless minority, their only source of protection was to blend in and hide in plain sight. Living so long in a foreign land, they wondered, are we still God's chosen people? heirs to the covenant and the promises given to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You see, they could not worship, for there was no temple. They could not sacrifice, for there were no priests. Were they even remembered? Were they seen by God? They hardly knew. So they clung tightly to hope, and work, looking with eyes of faith, they watched for the hidden hand of God. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power that comes from the pages of your word. And we pray now, Lord, for that transference of that power to our understanding. Not a familiar story, Lord, but instruction from you, the Most High God. We pray, Father, we would be open-hearted and open-eared and open-spirited to all that you have. And I pray for that transference, that anointing on my mind and heart through the prayerful preparation, Lord, through the attempt to capture what you have spoken and what you desire to lay before your people. May it feed them and may it feed me with a fresh anointing and a fresh word for all of us. May we receive all you have and may we go as you command. For we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Esther is one of the most intriguing books of the Bible. 
intriguing because there is no mention of God or any direct reference to him throughout. In fact, it has such a secular worldview that some have questioned its value. What can it really tell us about God's will and God's ways when he's not even mentioned? But I think its value is clear, for we too are navigating an increasingly secular world, and we would do well to listen to the wisdom in this ancient book. Because it is the seeming omission of God in the pages of the text that is the key to its impact, even its brilliance. Because the book of Esther invites us to interpret the actions of God when we have no direct word from God. And isn't that the ordinary way things unfold in our own lives? I mean, how many burning bushes have you come across Have you strolled through the mountains? How many, did you see the northern lights? Did a voice come to you from the heavens through that natural phenomenon? How many angelic encounters have you had with a direct instruction of something you're charged to do? Well, I personally have had exactly zero, which is exactly the point. God is alive and well, and he still speaks to his people. But like those in this ancient text, we must learn to discern God's activity in the world around us, his movement and instruction for us, based on what we know about his character and the record of action we find in the word. We too must learn and practice what it is to follow God by faith and discern his movement in our day, not based on what we see with our physical sight, but what we see through the lens of faith. And here's the core truth I want us all to take away from our time in the Word this morning. It's this. Faith is the lens we must look through to see the hidden hand of God. Now, to look through the lens of faith means you are walking and living by faith. And that means you're believing God really is who he says he is. Trusting that God will do what he says he will do. Knowing and living with the confidence that God will indeed keep his promises. Because living by faith is not just something we do in our heads. It's something to do with our whole being. It forms our decision. It directs our steps. It shows up in our everyday lives. And as we live by faith, the Spirit will align us so we're walking in obedience. He'll speak to us and direct us as we listen. So even though God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, his providential care is seen throughout. And as we observe God working behind the scenes, moving in situations, even though he appears absent, we can be encouraged that he is doing the same in our day because our God has not changed. We live in a world that all too often either ignores God, denies he exists, or seeks to make him into their own image. So let's watch for him to work in the secular kingdom as we see him work in the book of Esther. We can be reassured that he is active and working in our world and in our lives as well. And that's what the book of Esther invites us to explore. So let's do that this morning. Go ahead and open your Bibles. We're going to begin with Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over the 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the province. Now, some of your translations identify this king by his Hebrew name, Ahasuerus, and both are transliterations of the Persian name. So whether you have Xerxes or Ahasuerus, no, it's the same dude. And he was a dude. But what I want you to see is that this story, for all its fairy tale like quality, is really set in a real time, in a real place, and it takes course over the span of about 10 years. We read it quickly at a clip, like a four-act story or play or musical. But it's a peop- the record of people's real lives, walking in faith throughout a period of time. The citadel of Susa was the winter residence for the Persian kings. And if you're familiar with the book of Nehemiah, you know that he served as a government official there. Daniel had a vision of Susa. So it's a place of note in the ancient world and in the scriptures. We're told the king invited all his officials 
And while the party did offer him a way to show off his wealth and communicate his power, it was a working party. In fact, some historians call it a war council. Xerxes' empire was enormous. It stretched from modern Pakistan in the east to modern Turkey and the west. And it was filled with people with, of all different languages, ethnicities, and religions. And part of the reason he gathered those officials there was, yes, to show off his wealth, which we know is often associated with power, but also to convince them, to ingratiate himself with them, to be generous to them in this long, drawn-out season of partying so that they would be convinced and then give more resources to him to fund his next offensive against Greece. But we meet Xerxes in his glory days. His wealth and his, the extent of his kingdom was really amazing, even by today's standards. But what we're not told in the pages of our text is that this is the, not the end of his story. For the battle he was planning would become his demise. It would actually deplete that great wealth and signal his downfall. This historical reversal is not mentioned, but the original audience would have known it. And it provides a perfect backdrop for the many reversals that the plot does uncover. And I think that's an important point for all of us to remember, that this story is written in retrospect, after the facts played out, when the dust had settled and the author could look back on his life and see how God had intervened and how he had saved. And I wonder if part of the message of this little book for us is the challenge to watch God in real time today, not just wait for it to be over and then try to figure out where he was, but to trust him in the moment, in the midst, to work to experience his providential care by living with faith and hope, knowing that he is with us and working in a world even though it largely refuses to acknowledge his existence. So how do we do that? How do we interpret our times, look at our lives through the lens of faith and maintain a readiness to act? Well, it begins with the right perspective, an understanding embedded within the nature of this fundamental aspect of God's character, his omnipresence. God is omnipresent, meaning God is present everywhere. And David writes about the implications of this truth in a familiar Psalm, Psalm 139. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And the second character trait that's illustrated in the book of Esther is God's providence. And God's providence simply describes God's guidance or care. Webster's Dictionary, a secular source, says this, providence is God's interaction with and direction of humans through the fabric of circumstance. The world calls it fate. But the people of God, looking with eyes of faith, call it providence. And do you see the word provide embedded in the word providence? That's important because that's the truth of his providence, God's protective spiritual care, his guardianship. It shows up in the many ways he provides for us. But here's the truth. It takes faith to believe in God's providence, to trust that he truly is working behind the scenes. And then accepting that, living a faith-filled life, rooting, rooted in the belief that God is actively working and he will indeed come through. The prophet Isaiah said this about God's providence. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do as I please. And this from Psalm 119. Your faithfulness endures through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day for all things serve you. And providence is something we see lived out by the godly Old Testament man, Joseph, son of Jacob. Remember him? He was the one sold into slavery by his brothers, taken to Egypt, then wrongfully imprisoned and forgotten for years. 
But when he rose to prominence, he was able to proclaim this truth about God's providential care to the trembling brothers, the very ones who had abandoned him and sold him. And this is what he said. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So Esther and her guardian Mordecai would need to truly believe and apply these principles because the days were growing darker for them. They, along with all the Jews of the empire, faced the very real threat of violence, even annihilation. And as we'll study in the weeks to come, they maintained a readiness to act because of their core belief that God would deliver. He would come through. They may not have been able to fathom how, but they believed God would be victorious and his plan would not fail. Do you? How can we get there? How can we root our everyday life in that truth? Not just after the fact, when we know the end of the story, but now, as we're living in the midst of the mess. Because that's just where we find Esther, living in the middle of the mess. So turn with me now to the text. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. So Esther hid her real identity from the world. The writer introduced her to us as Esther, her Jewish name, but the world in which she lived only knew her as Esther, her Persian name. And Esther leaned into that identity. She dressed like a Persian. She ate like a Persian. And from what we can see in the first part of the book, she acted like a Persian. Now, the text is silent and makes no comment about this, but based on what we know of the Torah or the law, she was not living in the way of obedience. She ate forbidden things, and she ended up married to a Gentile. But before we judge her, let's remember the context of her situation and look back at verse number 8. It says, Esther also was taken to the king's palace, taken. It's not something she willfully chose. And that's important for us to see because sometimes things happen to us that are outside of our control. Now, we don't know what she was thinking or how she felt, but it's clear she was caught up in things much too powerful for her to extract herself from. And we don't know, as we'll discover in the rest of the series, But what we do know, as we'll discover in the rest of this series, is that as the sky began to darken, she realized it was time to come out of hiding and to press into who she really was. Not who she was to the worldly king she was forced to serve, but to the heavenly king to whom she willingly submitted. And this is what we can learn from Esther, the importance of knowing your identity. Because as her story plays out, We'll see her use her elevated position, not as a situation forced upon her, but as one into which God had placed her for the good of her people. Now, when it comes to confusion over our identity, there are many substitutes. And I wonder if Esther originally found her beauty in her appearance. Well, it's an easy thing to do, particularly in a culture like ancient Persia or, frankly, like modern America. There's nothing new under the sun. We've been worshiping beautiful things since the beginning. The problem, though, with beauty is it's temporary. The only beauty that won't fade is the beauty of the heart. But the world rarely notices that because it only looks with earthly eyes. Perhaps Esther found her beauty in her position or her identity in her position. It was beautiful, too. Her position brought power, and power is a heady thing. And to go from exiled peasant to queen of the empire, well, you could hardly blame her for digging all the splendor of the palace, could you? But was that who she really was? Well, the text is silent about all these things, but one thing is certain. We, too, can lose sight of who we really are and embrace the substitute identities forced on us by others or in our attempt to survive find that we lean into those too quickly. 
Friends, we must remember that we are called to be what the New Testament book of Titus calls a peculiar people. To not stick out just to be odd, but to march to the call of a different identity, allegiance to the unseen God we serve. Because we too can so easily find our sense of self within the world's labels and like Esther, begin to follow the playbook of the kingdom of this world rather than the kingdom of heaven. I think Esther teaches us one more thing, and it's the danger of fence sitting. It's just not sustainable. Her actions echo the words of Joshua who challenged the ancient Israelites to choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Esther came to a crossroads in her life where she had to make a choice. And we also need to make the choice to live into our true identity as God's people. Esther was forced into action because of the threat to herself and her people. Perhaps like Esther, our culture is forcing us into action. And we need to be called out of hiding and into action to represent God in our day. So ask the Lord to open your eyes so that you can see his hand in this world within the situations and circumstances in your own life. And to do that, you must continually watch for God. Watch for him. Observe his activity in the world. Look with eyes of faith, knowing he remains committed to his people, engaged in the affairs of humans. And he's ordering your steps. So Esther came to understand that her rise within the court was the Lord's doing. He gave her the platform. He provided the opportunity for her to save the people. But she had to step up. She couldn't be passive anymore. And she had to match a grit and a courage with the humility to move forward and do her part, trusting that God would stand with her as she went even with knees knocking into the presence of the king unannounced. It was because Esther believed God was still at work, even though he was unseen and unnamed. She was willing to stake her life on the fact of what the prophet Isaiah had said centuries earlier. He said this, clearly, you are a God who works behind the scenes, God of Israel, Savior God. And like Esther, for us to see God working behind the scenes requires effort. It means putting on the glasses of faith and stopping to look through the lens of the world and of our flesh and of the expectations of our culture. And if we refuse to put on those glasses of faith, if we refuse to refocus our vision as God would show us, we'll miss the opportunity. We'll be blinded to the places he's asking us to go and we'll never have the privilege of running his errands. But that takes humility to shift our focus from the assessments of the world to a submission to God. And it takes the practice, it takes the effort to wait on him in patience and trust for his timing to be revealed. We don't always understand. The prophet Isaiah also said this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For all that we don't understand about God's ways, for all the ways we disconnect from his thoughts at times, we must remember that no matter what, he is purposeful. He is taking us somewhere. He's taking you somewhere. This is how the Apostle Paul described God's providence in his letter to the Romans. Familiar verses, he said this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, so often we separate those verses apart and we rejoice in God's working all things together for us, for those who are called according to his purpose. But we lose the purposefulness of that working within us that's stated in verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, God is not so concerned with our comfort or our convenience. He is terrifically concerned with the development of our character. He often has much higher goals for us than we do. 
He's committing to transforming us so closely to the image of our son that he will do any and all things, including circumstances and situations that we would not pick, we can't control, and we wish we could get out of. But he's working. He's purposeful. Are you willing to watch for him and submit to it? Submit to his loving hand of direction, even if it includes correction. Trust him. Know he is taking you somewhere, and he was making you into the person he had in view for you from the beginning. And God will never force you. Esther was taken to the palace. She didn't choose it, but she did choose to live as God's daughter once she got there. That was the thing she could control. And even if your life feels like it's spiraling out of control, you can realign yourself to watch for God, look with eyes of faith. And as you do, you'll be able to do this third thing, which is choose hope. In the weeks to come, we're going to dive more deeply into the story of Esther and the miraculous way God saved his people from annihilation. And spoiler alert, in one of the great reversals, the tables were completely turned, so much so that the Jews were not only saved, they were elevated to a position of power. Isn't that just like God? But they had to walk through the flames to get to the victory. And so for us too, we must trust that justice will prevail in this world because God is still on the throne, even though it looks like it would never happen. Author and Duquesne professor Susan Mudo said this, God writes straight in crooked lines. Don't you love that visual? Think of the mess. Think of the disconnect. Think of the back of the tapestry or the what's behind the drywall, whatever you want to picture, and see God drawing a straight line to get where he's going from the beginning of time, what he has ordained. It's pretty crooked out there, but God writes with straight lines. Charles Spurgeon, the great British pastor, who's often called the Prince of Preachers, said this, the Christian believes God to be too wise to err and too good to be unkind. He trusts him where he cannot trace him. He looks to him in the darkest hour and believes that all is well. And that belief is rooted in hope, a hope of God, something we can't conjure up on our own because it's a hope rooted in God's character and his record of faithfulness. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Rome. He said this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So notice that's a conditional promise. God, the source of hope, will fill you completely because, or if, or when, what? You trust in him. See, trust is what unlocks that hope. Trust is what brings joy. Trust is what brings peace. And trust will lead you forward because God is good all the time. A number of years ago, I served at a district camp with an international worker from the Congo. And we worked together side by side throughout the week, ministering to the students and the adults. And we talked of many things, and one of them was how we were discipling the people the Lord sent to us. Well, it turned out we were using a similar resource. Course, hers was written in French, and mine was written in English, but it was the same material. And we gained much comparing and contrasting the ways our people responded to it. And the, the, the coursework was specifically designed to help believers recognize blind spots or strongholds or things that were keeping them from a deeper walk with God. And she described it so beautifully. She said, yes, I've come to recognize that the people I serve often adhere to a culture above Christ. That they serve the culture of their land, the culture of their family, and the culture of the ancient religions of that place with more strength and allegiance than they will serve Christ. And this is the example she gave me. She said, we would have a service. People would come forward to healing, for healing. They would be anointed and prayed over in Jesus' name. And on the way home, they would go to the witch doctor to receive what healing they could from him because they wanted to do both. And they couldn't shake the culture of their land and were never adhering to the culture of Christ. Friends, may it not be said of us.
we too can maintain an allegiance to the things of this world, to our culture, our family ways, our worldview, our politics, our place, our position, our anything, and raise those loyalties and live in obedience to that more than obedience to Christ. We must be careful that we don't become more passionate about any of those things than we are about Jesus. You know, when I was asked to preach this weekend after the election, I frankly didn't expect it to be all over. But may I say, regardless of your feelings about the outcome, may we as God's people live out the truth that Pastor Allen exhorted us with last week, knowing that the Jesus who unites us is far greater than any politics that can divide us. May it never be said of us, that we place our culture above Jesus Christ, that we place our politics above Jesus Christ. And I want to close with this passage from the prayer of Jesus, the one he prayed over us centuries ago. Listen to what he asked the Father on our behalf. He said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Holy means to be set apart. It means different from the ordinary. It means peculiar. It means having an allegiance the world doesn't understand, yet one that brings us joy and peace and confident hope rooted in him. And as we do, we'll serve the Lord fully, submitted by faith, not just here in our head, also here in our heart, but with everything we've got, fully submitted, ready for action, engaged and empowered by the Holy Spirit to move forward and be his people of promise in this place that is full of despair and despondency because their hope is in the things of this world and our hope is not. Our hope is in the things of our God and the kingdom that will come. And faith is the lens you must look through to see his hidden hand working even now, even today, and even in your life. So remember your identity. Remember who you are. Practice it. Tell yourself. Go into your Monday, day, Monday work reciting the truth of who you are. Go into your Monday work week, your school week. What's beyond the Steeler game? Watching for God. And choose hope. Choose hope, not in the circumstances, the situations, the noise around us. Choose hope in the living God. He saves. He is purposeful, and he's taking you somewhere. He's taking all of us somewhere. What a privilege it is to be his people in this time, to run his errands, to listen for his voice, and to follow. God is working, and nothing will stop his triumphant march through human history. Nothing, for he draws with straight lines. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'll ask my prayer team to come forward, please. And will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the power of your word. We thank you for the instruction from this ancient text. We thank you for the faithfulness of a woman who lived long ago. We thank you for the insight of her guardian who instructed her well. And we thank, thankful, Lord, that you will always redeem and restore and remember your remnant. Your eyes are on the faithful, and you are looking to and fro those whom you might strengthen because their hearts are fully committed. Lord, may our hearts be fully committed to you as we go out into our work week, as we go out into our families. May we represent you well and be allegiant to you alone, Lord Jesus Christ, for you are the only true king. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Okay, will you stand please for the benediction? Receive these words of blessing to you from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Have a great week.